concluded. Questions without notice. I call the member for Cunningham. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Could the Prime Minister live on the new start rate of $40 a day? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for her question. And like all of those who are on New Start or many of the other welfare payments uh, that uh, are provided to them by the taxpayer, uh, those payments are certainly modest, Mr. Speaker, and those payments are indexed every six months along with every other welfare payment. And the Australian public uh, provides that support, but the most important support that is provided by this government is to ensure that people can get off welfare and into work. And this government has set records, records, Mr. Speaker, both for youth unemployment, getting people into jobs, people right across the spectrum, older Australians, younger Australians, female Australians, getting them into work, Mr. Speaker, because the best form of welfare. The Prime Minister. Resume his seat. Members on both sides. Members on both sides. The manager of opposition business on a point of order. Yeah, thanks, Speaker. Uh, on direct relevance, it ought not be the case in a question like this that anything about New Start is in instantly in order, uh, and the Prime Minister has strayed well away. Members on my right. Yeah. Members on my right. There, there, there has been no reference whatsoever from the Prime Minister as to whether or not he could live on the amount. No reference at all. If members could cease interjecting, particularly so early, I have been listening very carefully to the Prime Minister. I have listened to the manager of opposition business, and uh, I do say to him, whilst I believe the Prime Minister is being directly relevant, as the standing order provides, it doesn't surprise me that he's raised a point of order because there have been a series of these. I just want to tell the House I have been reflecting on this matter, as I said the other day, and uh, I also said I didn't want to detain the House for too long, but I feel I now should at the, the start of a, a sitting week. And that is in reviewing uh, direct relevance, which the Leader of the Opposition well knows came in in 2010. Uh, he knows very well indeed, but I won't go to all of that. Uh, various speakers have had to navigate this. I think I'm navigating it consistently, provided he's on the policy topic. I did look at um, a ruling from former Speaker Harry Jenkins that I think does sum it up pretty well, and I'll just read it to the House. And this is when there was a series of points of order. Uh, well, actually, there would have been one because the rule has changed. Point of order relating to former Prime Minister Gillard's answer. And I think Speaker Jenkins summed this up uh, as best he could when he said, I believe so far uh, she's been directly relevant, if not giving a direct answer. And they are different things. The standing orders demand direct relevance. And he then went on, as I think the Leader of the Opposition uh, would remember, to so if there's going to be any other changes, then the procedure committee needed to look at it, etc., etc. But I think that's that's the principle I'm sticking with. And if the prime minister strays onto a, another policy topic, you'll be sure that I'll be acting very quickly to ensure he doesn't. Just on the point of order, the leader of the opposition. Speaker. Uh to be fair to former Speaker Jenkins when making that ruling, I doubt very much whether he was giving a ruling on the basis of a 12-word question. Yes, I We're think that's— We're asking one-line questions. Yep. That didn't happen in 2010. No, I think, and I think the Leader of the Opposition actually does, does make a, a, a reasonable point there, because I have uh, reviewed the question. It was a question about climate change, as um, members would appreciate at that time. However. The standing order for direct relevance, um, whilst a tighter question um, obviously demands uh, a, a tighter answer, uh, a question simply demanding uh, a yes-no answer, which that really does, you're entitled to ask them, but you're not entitled to demand that they be answered in that way. So I'm listening to the Prime Minister. He's being directly relevant. And the Prime Minister has Speaker, the, the best form of welfare is a job. That's what those on this side of the House believe, and I believe that's what Australians believe. And I want to commend all of those Australians 
who are on New Start now who are looking for a job, and our yeah, government yeah. will not rest until we get all of them into jobs, Mr. Member Speaker, because that's, that's the pledge we made at the last election of one and a quarter million new jobs over the next five years, and that comes on the back of 1.3 million jobs created since we first came to government. Now, I'm asked about the rate of New Start, Mr. Speaker. 555 a fortnight, but on average, an additional $130.50 is paid per fortnight two New Start recipients, Mr Speaker, and some 99 per cent, I'm advised, actually receive payments over and above New Start, Mr Speaker. But what I tell you what I won't do when it comes Members to New Start left. in this place, Mr Speaker, I will not engage in the unfunded empathy of the Labor Party, Mr Speaker. I will not go out, as the Labor Party did at the last election, pretending they're going to do something about New Start, but they won't tell Australians how much you're going to increase it by, how much is that going to cost Member and how are they going to pay for it, Mr Speaker? I won't do that, Mr Speaker. Our government has set priorities on investing in health, in schools, on education, Mr Speaker, on mental health, on combating the terrible curse of suicide in our country, on supporting our veterans, Mr Speaker. We have made those choices about priorities rather than increasing the size of the welfare budget, Mr Speaker. At the last election, the Labor Party came up with $387 billion of higher taxes, and they no, still couldn't it. come up with a way to fund an increase in the New Start allowance. So I will not allow this Labor opposition to go out and make all sorts of promises to Australians about New Start when they have no intention of funding it and no intention of backing it up with a real policy. Members on both sides, the member for Higgins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister inform the House how the Morrison government is on the side of Australian families by acting to shut down online child exploitation? The Prime Minister has the call. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Higgins uh, for that question. We are on the Australian side of Australians, as the member for Higgins is, and I congratulate her on her first speech in this in this place, Mr. Speaker. We're on the side of Australians on a whole range of issues. On the side of Australians who want to keep more of what they earn. We're on the side of Australians, Mr. Speaker, in rural and regional Australia who wanted their drought fund and who wanted to ensure that their roads are safer and our $100 billion worth of infrastructure is investing in a whole range of projects, including keeping our rural and regional roads safer. We're standing up to those big tech, big tech companies, Mr Speaker, who have such an important role to play in keeping our children safe online and combating sexual predators online, Mr Speaker. And right now, our Minister for Home Affairs, who is absent from the House today and is being represented by the Attorney General in this place, Mr. Speaker, is overseas in the UK working with our partners to crack down on child exploitation and to work with our partner agencies overseas so we can achieve that. So whether it's the combating the child sexual exploitation bill, which is being introduced into this place, which takes the action backed up by increased resources for the AFP and others to take action on keeping our children safe, we also have to ensure that we take on the big internet companies and make sure that the internet is not weaponised for sexual predators any more than it's weaponised by terrorists, Mr Speaker. And at the recent G20 event uh, that we had in Osaka, the G20 members agreed to take this issue on on Australia's recommendation. And that work continues. It, it work, that work continues here in this country as a result of acting on our task force report, as it does working with other jurisdictions to make sure we crack down on them. But, Mr Speaker, our government is committed to the Australian people and taking on the issues that they are focused on. And they are focused on trying to keep their children safe, whether it's online or in the physical world. They do want to keep more of what they earn. They do want to have access to a stronger economy, to more affordable medicines. They do want to get the best deal out of their energy companies and make sure that this parliament keeps those energy companies to account with the legislation that will come before this House that the Labor Party opposes, Mr Speaker. And they want to be kept on their side, Mr Speaker, their workplaces and not have them disrupted by militant unionists and having their workers' entitlement funds siphoned off by unions, Mr Speaker, and taken off to any which other form of expense they would have it. 
Politics today, Mr Speaker, and I believe it always has, it's not about getting people to be on your side, it's about a government that demonstrates that we are on the side of the Australian people, Mr Speaker, each and every time. That's what our government is doing, Mr Speaker. Nobody knows where the Labor Party stands anymore and whose side they're on, other than militant unions. The member for Morton. The member for Rankin. Thanks very much, Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Why does the government support cutting penalty rates when the Reserve Bank says that stagnant wages are a key contributor to slowing growth in the economy? The Treasurer has the call. Well, Mr. Speaker, we don't support cutting penalty rates, but we do support an independent arbiter, Mr. Speaker. And it's taken 53 questions from those opposite for the member for Rankin to get a question to the Treasurer, Mr Speaker. Now, the reality, the inconvenient truth for those opposite is that when we came to government in 2013, unemployment was 5.7 per cent. Today, I can inform the House, it's 5.2 per cent, Mr Speaker. And under Labor, the number of unemployed people increased by around 220,000 people, Mr Speaker. Now, it's an inconvenient truth for the member for Rankin. When Labor was last in office, those on a minimum wage were hit by real wage cuts in three out of six years. And in every year that we've been in government, the minimum wage has gone up, Mr Speaker. So when Labor was last in government, in three out of six years, the minimum wage was cut, Mr Speaker. Now, in terms of the growth in the National Wages Bill, which is otherwise known as the compensation of employees, it's 4.3 per cent higher through the year. This compares to 3.2 per cent when Labor was last in office. And finally, Mr. Speaker, the member for Rankin refers to the Reserve Bank of Australia. Now, in their statement on monetary policy on June, in June of this year, they said some recovery in income growth is likely because employment growth is expected to remain solid. Wages are expected to increase, and the tax offset for low and middle income taxpayers is set to come into effect in the second half of this year. So, Mr. Speaker, that is from the Reserve Bank of Australia. The in inconvenient truth for those opposite is that when they were last in government, unemployment was higher, more people lost a job. Under us, we're cutting taxes and creating more jobs. The member for Wide Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development. Will the Deputy Prime Minister update the House? how the Morrison government is on the side of regional communities who want roads to be safer, particularly in the electorate of Wide Bay. The Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Wide Bay for his question, Mr Speaker. He is a, a good member, a member who uh, puts road safety front and centre of many of the things that he does, Mr Speaker. And uh, just be quiet. You need to listen to this. You really do. No, you really do. You need, we're talking road safety. There's no need to yell out when we're talking road safety, and I'm going to try and do it in a bipartisan fashion. If you want to carry on like that, I won't be. But uh, I can well recall. I can well recall on the 23rd of April 2018 when I stood beside the member for Wide Bay at a press conference announcing the $800 million for the uh, Section D of the Bruce Highway, a highway that uh, is having $10 billion spent on it for road safety upgrades, for upgrades in general. And the member for Wide Bay was quite emotional. And I'll tell you why he was quite emotional, because before he came to Parliament as a police officer, he spent far too many nights doing that unfortunate death knock to tell a family that their loved one was not coming home. And that, that is why, why are you shaking your head? I mean, I mean, this is just unbelievable, Member for Barton. This is truly unbelievable. I mean, I mean, I'm talking about a death knock. I'm talking about road safety. I mean, seriously. Anyway, Australia has entered the age of infrastructure. We are spending money, Mr Speaker, on important road safety upgrades. $10 billion in making Queensland's Bruce Highway safer because one crash one fatality, one injury is one too many. And the member for Wide Bay knows that better 
than anyone as a former police officer, Mr. Speaker. And we've brought forward funding for works on the $1 billion Section D project. It will bypass the town of Gympie. Successive governments, and here's the bipartisanship, and I know the Leader of the Opposition uh, knows this all too well as well, uh, having he committed as well to road safety upgrades for the Bruce. Mr. Speaker, uh, successive governments have put in place upgrades on that road. Mr. Speaker, there's been a 31 per cent reduction in crashes, a 32 per cent reduction in fatalities and a 28 per cent reduction in injuries. And hopefully the good police officers from Wide Bay and elsewhere Mr. Speaker, won't have to uh, do those terrible early morning, late night knocks on the door of families to tell them that their loved one is not coming home. Now, Mr. Speaker, as part of the April 2 budget, we established the Office of Road Safety to provide greater leadership, national leadership and coordination of road safety efforts at an Australia-wide level. The Office was a recommendation following the inquiry into the National Road Safety Strategy 2011-2020. And through this strategy, Mr. Speaker, the government and the states and territories have a goal of reducing the number of deaths and serious injuries on our roads by at least 30 per cent by 2020, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, as we work towards Vision Zero, because that is the ultimate aim of any road safety measure. Yeah. The Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Treasurer, and it, I refer to his previous answer. Is annual wages growth now better or worse than when his government, the government came to office? The Treasurer has Speaker, it's 2.3 per cent is the wages price in index, and wages continue to go up. So it's, the, it's the independence question. Members on my left. Member for Chifley. The member for Melbourne has the call. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Reports have emerged that a wanted criminal wasn't arrested when he first landed in Australia and that his plane was recently searched on the tarmac but allowed to leave the country, even though an Interpol notice was in force. It's also been reported that he in fact got money and special treatment from Crown Casino and that ministers have lobbied Home Affairs to ensure that high rollers could fly into the country and drive to Crown Casino with a minimal amount of clearances. Can you assure the House that none of your ministers lobbied Home Affairs or its agencies on behalf of Crown Casino, which would breach your ministerial code of conduct? And can you also guarantee that no Home Affairs officials have acted improperly in these matters? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Melbourne for his question. It is a very serious topic and uh, it deals with the integrity not only of our gaming industry but uh, issues that go to law enforcement and border protection in this country, and I welcome uh, the, mem the member for Melbourne's interest in this topic. Our government takes alleg allegations of illegal activity very seriously. Everyone is required to abide by the Australian law, and that includes casino operators, public officials and all visitors to our country. Our law enforcement agencies are working hard to disrupt and deter criminal groups by collecting evidence and intelligence about financially motivated crime. And uh, while I can't go into the details of that for, for obvious reasons, which would be known to the member, um, these, these efforts are ongoing and will continue. Uh, in relation to the specific matters that were raised by the member, there has been nothing presented to me uh, that would indicate there are any matters there for me to address. The member for Curtin. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer please update the House on the ACCC's report on digital platforms and how the Morrison government is on the side of Australians to ensure that they get a better deal? Good question. The Treasurer has the call. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Curtin and congratulate her on an outstanding maiden speech in this parliament, Mr. Speaker. And she brings to this place a couple of decades of experience in academia, and that will be put to good use here, Mr. Speaker. And now, the member for Curtin, like others in this place, is aware that the member for Bradfield and I released last Friday the ACCC's groundbreaking report into digital platforms. It followed an 18-month inquiry which was initiated by the then Treasurer, now Prime Minister, into the social media uh, and search engine giants, in particular Google and Facebook. And the ACCC uh, used their compulsory powers to acquire information to look into the impact that the concentration in that market and the market power of those particular companies was having 
on consumer outcomes. And there were 23 recommendations across consumer outcomes, uh, competition outcomes, and a more level playing field for traditional media businesses. It has to be understood that both Google and Facebook are not only some of the most valuable com companies in the world, but also the most powerful, and they're ac absolutely ubiquitous across our economy and our society. In fact, Google has a 95 per cent market share of online search, and more than 17 million Australians log on to Facebook every month. And of the hundred, every hundred dollars in online advertising, excluding classifieds, forty-seven dollars is spent with Google and twenty-four dollars with Facebook. And the government accepts the overriding conclusion of the ACCC that there needs to be reform in this area and that these companies need to be held to account and that their activities are more transparent. So the government will conduct a 12-week consultation period with key stakeholders before providing its final response before the end of the year. And these recommendations refer to unfair contract terms, um, changing the merger laws, setting up a digital markets branch within the ACCC and also a code of conduct which would need to be approved by the regulators, which would create more transparency and a fairer deal uh, between traditional media businesses and Google and Facebook, as well as an ombudsman scheme which will help resolve disputes. Mr Speaker, we understand that Australians need to be protected. Their interests need to be protected in this age of digital disruption. And this groundbreaking, groundbreaking World First report provides a pathway for us forward. Here, here. The member for Rankin. Thanks very much, Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. How many of the 76 recommendations from the Banking Royal Commission has the government fully implemented? Yes, how many? The Treasurer has Speaker, the call. I can inform the House that we've already legislated recommendation 3.6, which will prohibit superannuation funds inducing employees. We've already recommended and legislated through this parliament recommendation 3.7, which introduces in civil penalties for trustees and directors of super funds. Mr. Speaker, we've already introduced and passed regulations which extend AFCA's remit for financial complaints back to 2008, Mr. Speaker, we've ensured, we're already passed regulations to ensure greater cooperation with AFCA, Mr. Speaker. Legislated product intervention powers for about the design and the distribution obligations for ASIC. We've agreed with the states and territories to develop a national approach to farm debt mediation. We announced that Graham Samuel would chair a review into APRA, and we've actually accepted the recommendations from that APRA review. Um, we've commissioned, Mr. Speaker, we've announced in the budget $649 million of extra funding for ASIC and APRA, which is a 25 to 30 per cent increase. Mr. Speaker. We're extending the jurisdiction to the federal court to include um, criminal, um, a, a criminal jurisdiction, Mr. Speaker, and the list goes on. Now, Mr. Speaker, members on the left, we ha there, was, there were 76 recommendations. Mr. Speaker, the other side are a complete joke. The other side are a complete joke. They, they took 22 days to respond. We took four days, and we're getting on with the job of legislating, past regulations, doing it carefully so that no mistakes are made. This is a critically important area. Now, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to an organisation like APRA, in Labor's last year in office, funding actually decreased not increased, Mr Speaker. Funding under us is now at a record level. We have passed legislation, passed regulations and getting on with the job of protecting Australian consumers. The, this, this looks dangerous. But, uh, <laughs> the member for Rankin is seeking to table a document. Speaker, I ask that the Treasurer table the list that goes on and on and on. <laughs> The member for Goldstein. Thank you, Speaker. The member for Goldstein has the call. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Housing and Assistant Treasurer. 
Will the minister outline to the House how the Morrison government is ensuring multinationals, including digital platforms, are paying their fair share of tax in order to fund vital services and infrastructure everyday Australians deserve? The Minister for Housing and Assistant Treasurer. Well, thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank, can I particularly thank the member for Goldstein for his question? And can I say that the Morrison government uh, is a government that absolutely believes in lower taxes. Absolutely believes in lower taxes, but importantly, we believe in a tax system with integrity. And we are determined, and we have shown time and time again, that we are determined to ensure that multinationals, including those on digital platforms uh, pay the right amount of tax in Australia to help fund the essential services that Australians deserve and require. That's why we've consistently taken action to close loopholes and ensure that the ATO, importantly, is resourced, has the right tools and resources required to detect uh, tax avoidance. Since, since the um, Tax Avoidance Task Force uh, was, out, was set up in 2016, which was a big moment for this parliament. Thirteen and a half billion extra dollars have flowed into the Australian revenue system. Thirteen and a half billion dollars. Now, we've got a lot of new members of this parliament. If somebody proposed legislation that was going to raise an extra thirteen and a half billion dollars to be spent uh, on Australian schools. Uh, on roads and infrastructure from multinational corporations, $13.5 billion from multinational corporations to be spent in this country. Do you think you'd support that legislation? Of course. Member for Chifley. I think undoubtedly you support legislation that somebody said would raise $13.5 billion extra. Guess what? To all those new members of this House, the Labor Party voted against it. They did. And believe it or not, and believe it or not, believe it or not, to get that legislation passed, we relied on the Greens. The Greens. So the Greens showed more economic sense than the Labor Party in supporting our multinational anti-avoidance laws, which have raised $13.5 billion. But it gets worse. You'd think the Labor Party would learn their lesson. We proposed um, to ensure that foreign digital platforms that were selling low-value goods into Australia collected and paid GST to level the playing field for Australian businesses that were competing against it. Well, that law, I can report to the House, in the first three quarters of the first year that it's been in place has raised $253 million. So $253 million via GST, which is funding schools and hospitals, collected from foreign digital platforms is now being spent and funding essential services in Australia. And guess what? The Labor Party didn't support that either. Can you believe that the, the Labor Party— The Minister's time has concluded. Members on, members on both sides. The member for Griffith. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction. I refer to the minister's earlier answer, claiming that a letter from farm organisations dated 3 October 2017 proves he was making constituent representations when he sought a meeting with the Department of the Environment and Energy six months prior. How could the minister seek a meeting as a result of a letter that didn't exist until six months later? The minister for energy has the call. You need hearing stuff. You know more than one farmer. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Speaker. Just hang on a second. The member for Chifley, I've asked him to cease interjecting on a number of occasions already. And he's obviously forgotten his warning last week. He'll cease interjecting or he'll cease to be in the chamber. I know it's a long time last week, but it's <laughs> okay. The minister has the call. Where is he? Why is he all the way back there? Uh, th thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I have already made a comprehensive and detailed statement on this matter covering exactly this issue to the House earlier today. And in that statement, I made clear that uh, through discussions with farmers in late 2016 and 2017, they demonstrated deep concerns about the impact of this listing on their farming operation. 
uh, and they pointed me to a National Farmers Federation submission made in 2014, expressing those concerns. 2014, uh, expressing those concerns about the impact of this listing on our farmers. But, Mr. Speaker, let's be let's be clear. Let's be if, clear. Just, if the minister could pause, if people on both sides could stop interjecting, as I've said, I'm trying to listen to the answer. The Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let's be clear about what this is about. Those opposite just want to smear farmers and those who represent farmers in this place, Mr. Speaker, because they are completely out of touch with farmers. We saw at the last election those opposite take policies to that election which would mean rolling out the draconian native vegetation laws in Queensland, the state laws across Australia, and, and, and in the process undermine the productivity and success of one of the great industries that has been the backbone of this country for so long, Mr Speaker. I will stand up for farmers every day in this place. That's what we do on this side of the House. The member for Boothby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction. Will the Minister update the House on how the Morrison government is on the side of Australians who deserve a better deal from big energy companies? The Minister for Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the honourable member for her question and for her strong focus on a fair deal for energy for the people in her electorate? Because on this side of the house, we are focused on lowering energy prices and ensuring the reliability of the power grid. That's why, that's why, from July 2, we've seen the introduction of the retailer reliability obligation, and that means that the big energy companies have to have supply in place to meet their customers' needs years ahead of time. Mr. Speaker. It's also why we've created our program to underwrite new reliable generation in the market, pushing power prices down, keeping the lights on. Mr. Speaker, it's simply not enough to have power when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing. We need it 365 days a year. 24 hours a day, and that's why we're sharply focused on keeping our existing coal and gas generation in the market running at full tilt, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. And I'm pleased to say, and I'm pleased to say, uh, that we will be bringing forward later this year the big stick legislation yeah. that those opposite have yeah. voted against. Again. They've voted against 13 times in this parliament, Mr. Speaker. Mr Speaker, this legislation is vital to ensuring that we have another tool in the toolkit to maintain supply in the market and drive prices, prices down. Because we saw, we saw in 2016, as a result of the reckless targets of the Victorian Labor government, uh, the exit of the Hazelwood power station and the mere announcement of that exit Mr. Speaker, saw a doubling of wholesale prices in Victoria. Since then, we've seen in Victoria, as a result of the exit of Hazelwood, prices hiking and lights going out. 200,000 Victorian households and businesses lost their power last summer, Mr. Speaker. And despite the clear failure of that policy and a similar policy from the previous South Australian Labor government, Mr. Speaker, those opposite want to roll this policy out nationally, Mr. Speaker. Nationally, during the last election, we saw independent modelling telling us uh, that doing so would double wholesale prices of electricity and triple the price of gas. Mr. Speaker, we on this side of the house sit on the side of a fair deal for the hard-working small businesses and households of Australia. The member for Lyons is always a contender for 94A, can I say? He's warned. The member for Griffith. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction. I refer to the Minister's earlier answers. Did the minister, uh, sorry, will the Minister table any correspondence about the grasslands listing from constituents received prior to his meeting with the Department of Environment and Energy in March 2017? Okay. 
The Minister has the call. Minister has the call. Minister for Energy. Mr. Speaker, I've already made a comprehensive and detailed statement in the House earlier today. And, and, and I tell you that the frustration of the farmers with this listing was clear. In 2014, in a table that I documented earlier today, as part of that comprehensive statement, the, the National the Farmers Federation. The Minister will just resume his seat for a second. The Leader of the Opposition uh, yes, on a Mr. point of Speaker. order. Yes, Mr. Speaker, it goes to relevance that we've got the letter in 2014. This is about any constituent correspondence. Any at all will do. Was there a single person who wrote to him about no, this prior to the meeting? The Leader of the Opposition resume his seat. Members will cease interjecting. The Minister will just wait, wait for a second. Um, I'll just make a couple of points in the practice that are irrelevant um, for the Leader of the Opposition and even for the question that was asked, um, I have to say. And, uh, the practice makes very clear answers. I mean, questions can elicit a, a yes/no answer, and that's a classic example of it. But that that can't be demanded uh, of the minister. So I'm listening to the minister. He's not 30 seconds in yet, and uh, if you need me to pull out the page of the practice, I, I will. But it's very clear in there. There's a long history of answers inviting a yes or no, and invite as you may. You can't demand a, a yes or no. I need to listen to the minister to check that he's being relevant and of course the only I mean I, I appreciate the question but um, obviously there's other sections of the standing was the practice that relate to um, not identifying uh, constituents but not, we're not at that point there's the Leader of the House on a point of order. In addition to that, it must have been the case that any correspondence or any oral representations um, went not in the position as a minister. I mean, they went from constituents to a member of parliament at that stage. Uh, the member for Cunningham is warned. Could you just repeat that last bit? I'm sorry, the Leader well, the, of the House. The representations that went from constituents did not go to uh, the member in his capacity as a minister because he didn't have the relevant portfolio. They went in his capacity as a member of parliament representing on a local issue. I'll hear from the manager of opposition business on that Thanks to that, that point of order. Yeah. Yeah. To that point, uh, the question begins by referring to the minister's earlier answers and whether it's relevant to someone's current portfolio or not. Once they have made a statement while in the current portfolio, then we are allowed to question that statement, which is specifically referred both in your own rulings and specifically He's referred to in practice. That. That's the point. Yes, I've, I'll, I'll hear from the Leader of the House. That relies on some previous reference by the minister to earlier correspondence. I don't certainly recall such a thing having occurred. Do members on my left wish me to wish me to actually address the point of order, or just watch them interject for 15 seconds? Yeah, I've I've, I've listened to both the leader of the house. Uh, and the manager of opposition business. Um, really, the point the manager of opposition business made is right. Once a, and I've ruled that way several times. Uh, once a, a minister can't be questioned about any of their previous portfolio responsibilities until such time as they address them, and once that's been done. Um, and that's why questions do refer to the minister's previous answers. And I've ruled numerous times um, uh, in accordance uh, with those precedents. So I think it's fine for the question to be asked, but obviously the, the manner in which it's been asked, it's, it's a matter for the minister uh, how he seeks to deal with that. The minister has the, has the call. Mr Speaker, in my statement earlier today in the House, I said that in late 2016 and early 2017, I spoke with farmers from Boora and Goulburn in my electorate and Yass, which had been in Hume until mid-2016, about this listing and their concerns about the listing. Mr Speaker, on, well, can I just the get the minister to pause for a second, which is precisely why I wanted to hear the minister. He is being directly relevant to the question. And 
unless you let me listen to him, I can't make that judgment, but he's being directly relevant to the question. The minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On 21 February 2017, I spoke with a farmer near Yass who expressed strong and detailed concerns about the revised listing, pointing out that it had occurred despite the concerns of the National Farmers Federation and the New South Wales Farmers Federation, and with little consultation with the farmers themselves, Mr. Speaker. And referring back uh, to the letter from the National Farmers Federation to de the department back in 2014, uh, they laid out very clearly that the pro proposed adjustment to the Leader listing the typifies the frustration of the farm sector in relation to listings under the EPBBC, and they made it very clear that the evidence supporting the listing is not sufficiently robust. Mr. Speaker. This was of deep concern to farmers across my electorate and across the region. I stood up for them, and the member for Eden Monero failed to do what he should have done. Members on both sides, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Member for Braddon. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Communications, Cyber Safety and the Arts. Will the Minister update the House on how the Morrison government is on the side of Australian families who want to keep their children safe online. Good. The Minister for Communications, <laughs> Cyber Safety and the Arts. Well, I do thank the member, member for Braddon. Uh, I congratulate him on his very strong first speech uh, last week, and he is a member with a strong interest in keeping Australians safe online. And he is on the side of the Australian people when it comes to keeping Australians safe online, and particularly when it comes to keeping children safe online. Mr Speaker, the Australian people know that the internet has brought huge benefits, but they are equally at the same time concerned about children being exposed to cyberbullying, about children being exposed to abhorrent, violent or pornographic material online. They are concerned about how we keep children and older Australians, indeed all Australians, safe online and Australians expect that the law will apply to maintain public safety when people interact in the physical town square we also expect that the law will apply when people interact in the digital town square mr speaker and that is our government that is the morrison government's expectation of social media platforms of search engines of websites whether hosted in Australia or around the world, if your services are accessed by Australians, you must comply with Australian law. Now, our Liberal National Government has a very strong track record when it comes to the question of online safety. In 2015, we established the world's first children's e-safety commissioner. We legislated a takedown regime for cyberbullying material directed at Australian children. In 2017, we expanded the eSafety Commissioner's remit to include all Australians. We introduced a civil penalty regime for image-based abuse online. We have a strong track record and we have strong plans for further reforms to help keep Australians safe yeah. online, including introducing a new Online Safety Act, adopting an online safety charter setting out our clear expectations, holding digital platforms to account through the recommendations of our task force to combat terrorism and extreme violent material online. So we have a strong track record, we have a strong plan and we have strong expectations of the social media platforms when it comes to keeping Australians safe online because we are on the side Mr. Speaker, of Australian families who want their children and all Australians to be safe online. The member for Griffith. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is again to the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction. I refer to the minister's earlier answers. Did the minister receive a single letter from any constituent about the grasslands listing prior to his meeting with the Department of Environment in March 2017? Yes, the Leader of the House. Well, Mr Speaker, 
the member is relying on previous answers to ask that question. And the minister has just noted that in his answers and statement there is no reference to correspondence, which is what the member is seeking to have tabled or an answer on. I just got to say to the Leader of the House, whilst he may well be factually right, that doesn't prevent the question being asked. Um, it's not an identical question. The only problem it would have would be if it was an identical question. And it's it's not. The minister has the call. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And whilst the question may not be identical, I have clearly answered the question in my previous answer. Uh, and I said in my statement earlier today, late 2016-17, I spoke with a series of farmers across my electorate and elsewhere about the concerns they had, and they pointed me. They pointed me Member for to Ballarat. the 2014 submission from the National Farmers Federation. And, and I go on on this letter, Mr Speaker. This letter is very important because it captured the concerns of the farmers. It said, based on the information provided, in the NFF's view, it is highly unlikely that an individual farmer would be able to assess their responsibilities under the EPBC. So this is a listing where the farmers were in a situation where they were not able to assess whether efficient pasture improvement and weed management could indeed be compliant. That is a very real concern for people who farm, and we understand farming on this side of the House, Mr Speaker. But I think what those opposite are actually suggesting is Member that for farmers Ballarat. should be named. And there is a very important piece of legislation going in front of this parliament in the coming weeks where there is an opportunity for you to decide whether naming farmers, naming farmers in the face of activism should be permitted. Has the Deputy Prime Minister is not helping again. Has the minister concluded his answer? The Leader of the Opposition is was seeking to make a point of order. If the answer's uh, over, we'll move on. The member for Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Communications, Cyber Safety and the Arts. Will the minister outline how the government is demonstrating it's on the side of Australians who want to protect their families from exposure to extremist content online? The Minister for Communications, Cyber Safety and the Arts. Well, I do thank the member for Robertson who has a strong interest and indeed strong expertise in the question of keeping Australians safe online. Like me, a former telecommunications executive, I was at Optus, she was the at Telstra, and I'm delighted to now be on the same team as the member for Robertson. And the members for Robertson shares the concern of all on this side of the House, indeed I'd suggest all on all sides of the House, about the online streaming of violent material, of extremist content online. Of course, on the 15th of March, we saw an appalling terrorist attack on two Christchurch church mosques, which took 51 innocent lives. And of course, appallingly, appallingly, it was live streamed, magnifying the horror and reach of this attack. Now, Mr Speaker, the Morrison government acted very swiftly and strongly to prevent social media platforms being used to facilitate the spread of this abhorrent content. We did that because we are on the side of Australian families who are determined to keep their children safe online. And Prime Minister Morrison took a very strong leadership position, not just in Australia, but globally. And our Morrison government will not be letting up on this issue. On the 30th of March, the Prime Minister established a task force with representatives from major social media platforms, including Facebook, Facebook, Google, Twitter, Microsoft and Amazon, as well as a range of leading internet service providers. Uh, and the Prime Minister drew international attention to this issue at the recent G20 meeting in Osaka, successfully garnering the support of global leaders to secure a statement from the G20 Leaders Summit that was a show of unity in the fight against terrorist and extreme violent content online. And that is 
very much about very clearly stating our expectations of the social media platforms. We move to legislate so that internet and hosting service providers are required to report and remove such material, and the penalty for failing to remove such content expeditiously is up to 10 per cent of the annual turnover of the company. Uh, on the 30th of June, I joined with the Prime Minister to release the task force consensus report laying out nine action areas, 29 recommendations such as appropriate checks on live streaming. We will expect the global digital platforms to give us serious and meaningful plans in line with their commitments. We are determined to pursue this matter. We are not letting up. We are on the side of Australian families when it comes to keeping them safe online. Members on my left. The member for Morton, I'm sure, was in there somewhere. <laughs> the member for Griffith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction. I refer to the Minister's previous answers. Is it just a coincidence that the consultant who gave the go-ahead to spray critically endangered grasslands on the Minister's land also advised the authors of the letter about so-called problems with the listing? The Minister for Energy has the call. Mr. Mr. Members on my left. Minister has a call. Mr. Speaker, I've already made a comprehensive and detailed statement to the House earlier today, for Isaacs. Where, where I made clear, I made clear uh, that my focus in my work as the member for Hume is was the technical aspects of the listing and ensuring that farmers get a fair deal <laughs> under this listing. That was my focus. And that remains my focus, and that is my job, because there are only two people in this parliament who have regions covered by this, and only one was ever going to advocate for the farmers across that region, and that was me, Mr. Speaker. And that was me, Mr. Speaker. But the question is, the question I Members want to know, on my left. the question I want to know, is what have those opposite got against hard-working farmers? What have they got? against hard-working farmers, because we've seen in this place now a targeted and deliberate approach from those opposite, not just to demonise them, but to fail the, to support them when it really counts, Mr Speaker. Just last week, they voted against the government's drought fund, which would help farmers when we're doing it tough. This is a vital fund. This just, is a vital I just, fund. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition might resume his seat for a second. The, the, the minister is now straying from uh, the subject. Uh, no, no, the Leader of the Opposition, you, you, you didn't have the call. Has the Minister concluded or the Minister has it? It's October they, 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 they failed to. But, Mr Speaker, this is a vital fund. It will grow from 3.9 to 5 no, billion just to the, over the next decade. No, and the, and no, it is the support the that farmers need. You minister, need to provide that support as well. The member for Ryan. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. Will the Minister outline to the House how the Morrison government is demonstrating is on the side of Australian families who need access to life-changing cancer and other medications on the PBS? The Minister for Health. Very much, uh, thanks very much, Mr Speaker. And I want to thank the, uh, the member for Ryan. Uh, he grew up as the son of uh, two pharmacists. and so. Uh, even as a young boy, he understood the importance of the PBS to Australian families, to what it meant for families seeking to have access to high-cost medicines for conditions that could otherwise be fatal or devastating or debilitating. He also grew up as the son of small business owners, people who understood exactly what it meant to have a strong economy and the ability to pay for these medicines. And, uh, so realise right from the earliest days that to see things such as we saw in 2011 when medicines were stopped from listing because the economy was not strong was not the sort of thing that would ever happen under a coalition government. And I'm delighted to say that because the economy is strong, because the Prime Minister has the commitment to list the medicines that the medical experts recommend, we are able to make listings such as those announced only yesterday. And yesterday, we were able to make announcements for glioblastoma. 
the member for glioblastomas and for acute lymphoblastic leukaemia and for neuroendocrine tumours. These are things that are real and significant and important. They're the things that actually matter to Australians. Member for McMahon. So these are the medicines which we announced yesterday. I was delighted to announce them uh, with the, uh, the member for Higgins. In particular, I met a patient, Hugh. Hugh has been suffering from uh, a glioblastoma, or so a brain tumour. Uh, Eighteen months ago, he was given a very short period of time to live. He was given access to Avastin. Avastin is the medicine we listed yesterday. Uh, 900 patients will now have access to that medicine, uh, which would otherwise cost $31,000. He was given, in his words, the gift of hope and the gift of life. And he was deeply thankful for that and understands that this is one of the hallmarks of Australia as a society, as a compassionate society, as a strong economy, as a country which is able to do extraordinary things. Similarly, I met a patient, Michael. Michael Clout, it turns out, we discovered afterwards, had played rugby with the Prime Minister when they were students. He said, uh, as a uh, rugby player, he makes a great Prime Minister, no offence. Uh, but significantly, Michael was uh, suffering from uh, Philadelphia positive acute lymphoblastic leukaemia. He was given uh, two years to live in 2011, but through a combination of trials and early access to this medicine, he isn't just alive today, he's thriving today. And this medicine, Sprycell, which saved his life, is now available on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme. It's 80 patients, because that's the population that will benefit from it, at a saving of 51,000. This the is saving lives time and protecting has lives. Concluded. The Manager of Opposition Business. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction. Can the minister confirm that his statements to the parliament now offer three reasons for why he held a meeting with the Department of the Environment in 2017? One, somebody wrote a letter six months after the meeting that was addressed to somebody else. Two, somebody wrote a letter three years before the meeting that was addressed to somebody else. And three, he had a conversation with a bloke in yes. Yes. Isn't the only consistent interest here his own? The Minister for Energy has the call. Women are farmers too. Women are farmers too. The Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. That, that question shows the disdain that those opposite have for the farmers of Australia, the contempt they have for the farmers of Australia. Well, I'll always back our farmers. I will always back our farmers. I do it every day, Mr Speaker, and I refer to the comments that I made in my comprehensive and detailed statement earlier today. The member for Bonner. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Industrial Relations. Will the minister explain how an application for deregistration of an organisation can be made under the Morrison government's Ensuring Integrity Bill? and how this compares to the existing law and previous deregistration proceedings. Good question. The Minister for Industrial Relations and the Leader of the House. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for his question. And obviously, as everyone in the House would know, there are um, presently in the Corporations Act, under Section 461, the ability to wind up a corporation. There are general grounds for doing that when it's just and equitable to do so. There are specific grounds listed as well. There are also presently grounds to deregister either an employee or employer organisation, but they have proved ineffective and, in fact, they have never been able to be successfully applied to deregister any organisation. That is despite the fact that those laws are meant to apply in circumstances where we now have the CFMEU being the most unlawful organisation in the history of Australia's industrial laws. The most, including the BLF, but we'll get to that in, the, in a moment. If you want to talk about the BLF, and what are, Mr. Speaker, the amended grounds for deregistration? These are the amended grounds for deregistration. This is what the bill actually seeks to do: allow deregistration where the organisations fail to conduct the affairs in the interests of members. Seems very reasonable, or where there have been multiple breaches of the law by a substantial number of the members or where there have been serious breaches of the criminal law by the organisation itself. They are the standards that Labor now pose. 
They are the standards that are needed to ensure that you can have adequate deregistration of an organisation. And Mr. Speaker, the organisation that we are talking about, how might the CFMEU be described? Well, here are the words of a federal court judge describing that organisation. He said, There is no evidence before me of the CFMEU taking any compliance action in order to prevent the recurrence of contravening conduct by them in the future, nor is there any evidence before me of any compliance regime ever being put in place by the CFMEU to address its long history of prior contraventions. How did the judge describe that long history of prior contraventions? As an appallingly long history of prior contraventions in the industrial law. Despite that appallingly long history, the present laws have never been successfully able to be applied. Now, compare that attitude from members opposite to this situation with what real members of the Labor Party did with respect to the BLF. When Ralph Willis was the minister, this is what he said in 1985 of the BLF. He said they had gone far beyond the bounds of normal industrial behaviour. He said the thuggery, the violence and the intimidation have had disastrous impact not only on building employers but also on fellow workers in the industry. What did Labor do then when faced with similar circumstances? They actually brought in a specific bill to give executive powers to get rid of the BLF to deregister it. Now they will not even support, now they will not even support a slightly enhanced standard how the Labor Party is forward. The member for Griffith. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction. I again refer to his earlier answers and to the letter from farm organisations dated 3 October 2017. Is the single alleged EPBC breach referenced in that letter the alleged poisoning of critically endangered grassland on the minister's land? The minister has the call. M Mr. Speaker. Uh, the, the environment is not my portfolio responsibility. I have no idea Members how you would left. expect me to answer that question. But this is the ongoing contempt and disdain you show for the farmers of this country. The member for Mayo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the Environment. On the 26 of October 2018, I joined local conservation groups in writing to the Secretariat of the Ramsar Convention on wetlands of international importance about the rapid deterioration of the Coorong and Lower Lakes Ramsar site. Our letter constituted an Article 3.2 notification and requires the government to respond within three months to a detailed questionnaire on what measures have been put in place to rectify the deterioration. Would the minister please advise the House of the government's response? The Minister for the Environment has the call. Um, can I thank the member for Mayo for her question and her keen interest in the Coorong, a vital part of her electorate of Mayo, and indicate that the letter that she refers to was received before I was sworn in as Environment Minister. The Ramsar Convention, as she notes, is an international convention on the conservation of wetlands, particularly when it comes to the habitat of, habitat of water birds. I'm very happy to follow up where that information is and get back to the member. Now the call needs to allocate that the member for alternate, I should say, the member for Menzies. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Industrial Relations. I ask him would he advise the House on whether payments have been made from workers' entitlement funds to organisations of employers and employees, and whether the Morrison government's protecting workers' entitlements fund bill will address these practices. The Minister for Industrial Relations and Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the member for his um, question. And as the member is well aware, workers' benefit funds not being properly regulated means the theft of money that should go to workers. And the proper use of workers' benefits bill presently before the House probably dates back the need for it as far as the Coal Royal Commission. These funds are meant to keep capital amounts safe and protected to pay for workers' entitlements. And back in the days of the Coal Royal Commission, uh, the Royal Commissioner noted that the funds provide substantial income streams to employer and employee associations in the form of surplus distributions. He noted that there was an incentive for these bodies to negotiate or agree to increases in employer contributions in the course of negotiations. And he said very uh, properly 
These funds should be used for the purpose for which they were intended and no other. And back then in, in the Colerore Commission, he was talking about the surplus, the interest earned on the capital. And as we've heard in Parliament over the last several days, we have an example before us as a parliament where they've actually distributed the capital out of the account. And what needs to be made very clearly here is this point, is that the regulation of these funds that the government brings to the House will regulate it for the purposes of both employee and employer organisations. And in making that point, I wanted to make some further comments about this $32 million that was moved, a capital amount, from the organisation Protect, meant to pay for severance funds in the future for electrical workers, moved out to the ETU. And over the last several days, the ETU has been referring people off to a joint statement that they gave with the National Electrical Communications Association, the Employer Association. And in effect, what the ETU now say is, well, $32 million was transferred to us, but look, it's OK because we only kept 75 per cent. The other 25 per cent of it went to the National Electrical Communications Association, an employer association. And very disturbingly, over the last several days, as NECA, as they are known, have been asked, and indeed their chief executive officer has been asked to explain the use of that money. That's $10.4 million, by the way. They have declined to respond to the journalists' inquiries. Now, I would very warmly encourage some kind of proper response. When you actually go and look at NECA's accounts, the Employer Association, they note in their last financial report that the $10.4 million profit share from Protect quote, helped turn around a 600000 operating loss for the employer group sure and create a $9.7 million profit. Sure well, $10 million will tend to do that. It does tend to turn around your financial accounts. But how is that money being spent to benefit workers? Where is the answer as to how that money is being spent to benefit workers? And why will you opposite not support a bill that allows for transparency and regulation and adequacy of those arranged? Just remind the minister not to refer to me, if you can avoid it. <laughs> the, um, Member for Griffith. Yes, thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction. I again refer to his earlier answers and to the letter from farm organisations dated 3 October 2017. Given the Minister refused to answer, I ask again, is the single alleged EPBC breach referenced in that letter the alleged poisoning of critically endangered grassland on the Minister's land? The Minister has the call. <laughs> Mr Speaker, that is the same question and it, it gets I'll the same answer. It, yep, the, the Minister has the call. Mr Speaker, that is the same question and it will get the same answer. It's not my area of portfolio responsibility. But let's be clear, through the Members course on my left. of the questions today and, and the actions the of, the of those opposite over recent weeks and months, it's clear, it's clear that they believe that farmers subject to regulation where they can't assess their responsibilities don't deserve representation. They have made clear uh, that a regulation which implies they can't with any confidence improve their pastures or manage their weeds is OK and they don't deserve representation. Uh, they, they have in recent times made clear Member that they think farmers don't deserve a drought fund and, and they are OK with farmers being named in the face of activism. We'll stand up for farmers. You need to learn a lot more about them. Yeah. The member for Nichols. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Water Resources, Drought, Rural Finance, Natural Disaster and Emergency Management. Will the Minister update the House on how the Morrison government is on the side of Australian farmers and communities battling drought? The Minister for well, Water thank you, resources. Mr. Speaker, and can I thank uh, the member for Nichols for his question because he sees firsthand on a daily basis the impact this drought is having on his constituents, and not just farmers, but businesses, small businesses that support these communities. And that's why he understands the historic nature of the future drought fund that we passed last week. This is a centrepiece for the first time in our nation's history, a drought centrepiece. A $3.9 billion fund. The minister will just to pause for a second. The member for Lyons will leave under 94A. The minister 
Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A $3.9 billion fund climbing to $5 billion, giving a $100 million dividend year in, year out. This is in addition, addition to the $2 billion worth of measures that this government has put in place around farmhouse allowance, mental health, also rural financial councils, but importantly, community drought program. $1 million to the 110 shires out there to help support them to procure local materials and tradies, to go and do projects that give community benefits and economic benefits. This is a stimulus to keep these communities moving. Also, the on-farm water infrastructure, $50 million to help preparedness into the future for our farmers to invest in desilting dams while they are dry. And I've asked the Prime Minister, who has approved, to extend this just from not livestock producers but now to permanent planters, plantings in horticulture, yeah, yeah, a common-sense approach to make sure we are Absolutely. delivering. But the $100 million will be delivered on 1 July next year, and we are putting probity around that to make sure that we are consulting with those who own this money, the Australian public and, more importantly, those communities out there, about a way that will give them real benefits real benefits in terms of climate risk, in terms of extension work, and also in terms of leadership. This is about engaging with the community who deserve this money to build for the future. And so the consultation group that I will have will have a wide range of skills, skills that will be able to make sure that the 42-day legislated consultation period gets real outcomes back to this parliament, to be able to, in, to give integrity to this $100 million a year, not something that has been appropriate, as the Labor Party wanted to do, but also to make sure that it is there and it can only be changed by legislation. It cannot be taken away by the whim of a Treasurer. It is legislated because we took the hard track, despite the setback that we got in October last year by those opposite not supporting it, not standing with us, standing with Australian farming families and Australian communities. It took, the, it took a federal election for them to listen to listen to the Australian people, but more importantly, listen to Australian farming families and communities that this government, from the very start of this drought, was going to stand shoulder to shoulder with them. We were going to support them and their communities, and that's why this fund will go to the longevity of regional rural Australia, and we will continue to stand shoulder to shoulder with Australian farming families and communities into the future. Yeah. Yeah. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice.